بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, again uh, good evening uh, all colleagues all over the kingdom and internationally i'm honored today to share with you a few points uh, about the recent uh, updates about the covid uh, in relates to the basic and advanced life support as was recently published from uh, major uh, life support institutes internationally Again, I'd like to thank the, our uh, colleagues at the uh, Saudi Critical Care Society and Dr. Tariq al Haid for giving me this opportunity to share with you these uh, uh, new recent evidence-based updates. And I would like to also thank the Saudi Commission for Health Specialities for their excellent efforts in introducing these uh, initiatives to uh, all, all the healthcare workers everywhere. So uh, to start with a disclaimer, again, I have no conflict of interest and all the, uh, if any uh, material or any products are shared here as a pictures, they, I don't have any, uh, I don't recommend any specific products. We are just interested uh, about the science behind applying them. Uh, as I mentioned, the slides are based on the most recent peer reviewed publications. Uh, and uh, they are presented here mainly for guidance. However, all of us, we have to adhere to the most recent guidelines from our hospitals and our Ministry of Health. Uh, as an outline, we'll go through an introduction and uh, some update about the COVID uh, that relates to the pediatric. Uh, going briefly about some principles behind the, what is different in the uh, basic life support and pediatric advanced life support that relates to the COVID. Um, I will touch based on the neonatal, uh, some neonatal issues and about uh, resource utilization, of especially about the uh, PPE conservation, uh, some uh, innovations and uh, what future directions, and we'll end up the session with a uh, quality, uh, question and answers. So if you have any questions, you can uh, submit them anytime during the talk to uh, through our chat to our panelists, and we'll try to accommodate as much as we can. So as I have uh, said recently, we had this uh, interim uh, guidance for uh, the both the BLS and the PALS that was uh, recently published uh, from the American Heart Institute, uh, American Heart Association. Uh, again, this was a joint effort together with the uh, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Association for Respiratory Care, the American College of uh, Emergency Physicians, and the Society of Critical Care Anesthesiologists, and the American Society of Anesthesiologists. And uh, uh, one of the issues that uh, I will uh, highlight uh, that these interim guidelines do not apply to patients who are known to be COVID negative. So these are only for the COVID suspected or COVID proven. Uh, the COVID negative patients, they will be continued as the same algorithms that we're running before. These algorithms, uh, sorry, I just forgot. I put here in the graphs, as you can see, uh, I have added uh, some gra uh, codes. So if you wanna take, a snapshot of this video, of this uh, presentation, and later on you can scan the code to reach the exact reference, the one that is quoted on each uh, slide. So you can just go ahead, take a snapshot, and then you can review the, uh, the full guidelines uh, from the source directly. Again, as I mentioned, uh, it was also endorsed uh, these guidelines similarly, uh, but briefly in the, from the European Society of Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care. And uh, they are almost going parallel uh, to each other. Uh, and so I put the reference there for your uh, uh, reference. And again, they are, uh, as you can see, uh, they are highlighting uh, about uh, that these are supposed uh, intended as a guide only. You have to follow your institutional or government specific guidance. And uh, this was issued just a few days back. So as we have seen so far that the 
with the COVID, uh, with the COVID pandemic that we are having uh, about up to 20% of patients requiring hospitalizations and around uh, three to six percent of them, depending on the literature uh, uh, data source, uh, they are becoming critically ill with increasing uh, infections internationally. So we are expecting to see more patients presenting with uh, COVID and having uh, going to cardiac arrest requiring some resuscitative efforts at one stage. Uh, two days back, there was a recent publication uh, by uh, Pathak. Uh, et al. showing that uh, the, reflect, uh, the uh, expectations of COVID-19 in children in the United States. And uh, again, this is the code here for if you want to take a, a snapshot of this slide to review this uh, uh, article. They main, their main objective was to provide evidence-based estimates of children infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the projected uh, cumulative numbers who uh, may become uh, critically ill children and uh, thus uh, require PICU admissions. And the projected numbers of severely and critically ill children uh, were derived by applying the uh, adjusted severity and criticality, uh, criticality proportions to the US population data under the several scenarios of cumulative pediatric infection proportion. So uh, based on the 74 million children aged up to 17 years of age in the United States, the projected numbers of COVID, if they apply the uh, 5%, uh, if they apply the 5% scenario, they estimated about uh, 1,100 patients may become children, may become critically ill and requiring an ICU admission. Whereas if they go to the scenario predicting 50%, then they estimated around 11,000 11, children who would require PICU admission during this uh, COVID uh, pandemic. So the authors concluded that the projected numbers of severe cases would overwhelm the available pediatric hospital care resources under several moderate CPIP scenario models. And despite the lower severity of COVID-19 in children than in adults, however, we may still face some uh, issues to be addressed. So back to the life support, which is uh, the main focus of our presentation today. So uh, as uh, you know, the previous guidelines, the HA guideline did not address in details how rescuers uh, must balance uh, between their own safety and between uh, the immediate need of the patients. Uh, therefore, they recently issued the, this uh, interim guidance to help rescuers treat victims of cardiac arrest with a suspected or confirmed uh, COVID. Now, this is the issue about how to maintain the balance for uh, in such a scenario. This is probably it's inside the minds of each one of us. So, how can I optimize my patient's immediate uh, CPR needs? versus uh, not compromising my rescuers, my uh, healthcare providers, our health system uh, to any uh, safety concerns, keeping in mind that uh, uh, there is a high uh, uh, transmissibility for COVID-19. And especially this happens even more during the CPR. And also that COVID carries a high uh, morbidity and mortality. So we have these challenges that are at the back of our minds. And as you know, the, some predisposing factors to cardiac arrest in COVID patients are like uh, the hypoxemic respiratory failure, secondary to the ARDS, the myocardial injury, ventricular arrhythmias or shock, and uh, some also uh, predisposed uh, due to the medications that may be used in the treatments of this uh, disease like hydroxychloroquine and the azithromycin which can prolong the QT. So we have so many predisposing factors but how we can balance them, what are the general principles for uh, resuscitation in such suspected or confirmed COVID patients, we're come, gonna, gonna go through them in the next few slides. But let's have some interaction with the audience. So if you can kindly see now you will have a poll which uh, let's share together and this is i'm trying to make it 
as much interactive uh, as possible. Uh, so now uh, let's share what do you think about this question. So for hospital healthcare providers in case of an urgent need to CPR on COVID suspected child, I'm talking about a child now, what do you think that the healthcare provider or healthcare worker should start the CPR immediately even without proper PPE or the healthcare uh, worker should start only with the chest compressions immediately, even without the PPE, while the other colleagues can put on their PPE to go for other uh, aerolization procedures like uh, back mass ventilation or intubation until the full PPE is donned by them, or the healthcare worker must don PPE before any CPR procedure. Again, we are focusing about the pediatric. So let's see. Uh, how the vote goes. We'll just wait for a few seconds and if you can kindly uh, vote uh, and we'll share together our voting uh, from all over the colleagues. So far we have about 6,000 colleagues uh, who are logged in. So hopefully we'll see what they think about for the pediatric Okay, so we'll ask our panelists to kindly share. Okay, wonderful. So that's a great result. Uh, again, if we can just discuss it. So we have the majority agree that uh, they initially, so we have 54% saying, no, we have to put on our PPE first. Uh, we have 35% who are saying, no, we can start maybe with only the chest compressions and delay the any uh, aerosolization procedure, whereas 10% they want to jump and try to rescue the patient immediately. So let's go through some further uh, discussions. Again, we are talking about how to reduce the provider exposure to COVID-19 and thinking about some ethical principles that were included in the interim uh, 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 report by the HA. They said that all providers must protect themselves and their colleagues and uh, colleagues and patients from, un unnecessary, from any unnecessary exposure. Again, we have to uh, bear in mind that any exposed providers who contract the COVID will further decrease the already strained workforce availability to respond and will have also the potentials to add additional strain if they become critically ill themselves. So it's like uh, it's like uh, two uh, two hits. First of all, you may lose that healthcare worker where he may need to go to uh, self quarantining for about two weeks, so he cannot join the workforce during that time. Plus, if he becomes sick himself, not only he cannot care for other patients, he will be an extra burden, and that's why. No, they, ensure, they emphasize that all providers must protect themselves before starting any CPR. The CPR poses a special risk for our, uh, uh, for our healthcare uh, workers. As we mentioned, there are numerous uh, aerosol generating procedures such as the cyst compressions themselves, the positive pressure ventilation, bag mass ventilation, uh, the intubation itself, and it was found that the viral particles may remain suspended in the air with a half time of approximately one hour. Furthermore, the CPR requires numerous providers to work in close proximity to one another and to the patient. So that's, again, it's the opposite of the social isolation, which is the key to decreasing the transmission of the COVID disease. As well as uh, we have noticed in many simulation set, uh, settings that the high stress emergent events in which the immediate needs of the patient requiring resuscitation may result in lapses in the infection control practices. And probably you can anticipate or we have seen that in uh, several occasions. So that's three major risks for uh, COVID transmission during CPR. Back to our strategies, how to eliminate them. So before entering uh, any scene before going to the patient, all rescuers should have full PPE, which is either airborne or droplet alone, 
It depends on what's your uh, institute, what's your local implemented uh, guidelines. So please always keep updated with them. And expecting any staff to resuscitate without proper PPE is not acceptable according to the guideline, which makes a lot of sense. And this is have been already supplemented with uh, several publications from the literature. And another point they are emphasizing that to limit the personnel uh, in the room to only those essential for the patient care. Again, this is different from the pre-COVID uh, era where we used to have a lot of uh, people coming to help around the patients. Currently, we need to limit only to the minimum, which is really needed number. Okay. And part of this uh, limiting the personnel around the patients is if your hospital has it and uh, if the patient fits the manufacturer's uh, requirements, then you may consider uh, applying uh, one of these uh, devices during uh, CPR chest compressions. And uh, probably some of you have seen it uh, in practice. So this is one of the issues, but this is more of the adults or the older adolescents. Again, part of the eliminating the spread during the prior, how to prioritize the oxygenation and ventilation strategies with lower aerosolization risk. And uh, they are emphasizing the closed circuit, ca which carries a lower risk of uh, aer uh, aerosolization once the patient is intubated. So again, if the patient, uh, you are considering to intubate the patient or not, go ahead for intubation earlier, better than spreading the virus all over. And once you decide for intubation, this is another emphasis. If hospitals do not have the, uh, if not routinely using the cuffed ET tube, it's better to uh, go with the cuffed ET tube, even for infants. Uh, because uh, that will again limit your uh, exposure for other uh, for for the virus uh, aerosolization uh, to connect the ventilator uh, to a HEPA filter in the path of the exhaled gas and whenever uh, possible to use an inline suction catheter which may again help to reduce the viral spread Other strategies uh, to apply is uh, to engage the intubator with the highest chance of first pass success. So this is the time to uh, check who is the best one among your team for in the intubation, because that will limit the attempts of uh, failed, into, failed uh, intubation and as well as decreasing the need for bag mass ventilation. So they emphasize in the guidelines to uh, the most senior in the airway to use this, uh, to go for the procedure. And during the intubation process, you have to pause the chest compressions. Okay, this will limit, th this will decrease, this will decrease the viral spread and the aerosolization. And probably also it will give you a better chance to intubate the patient from the first go. They advise to consider the use of the video laryngoscope whenever it's available. I'm just putting here uh, various uh, designs of video laryngoscopes. I'm sure most uh, many hospitals uh, have them already. So please try also, if you have them, let your team uh, try to practice them before the real emergencies because they require a little bit of skills to get used to them. And once they are uh, in use, they are much safer and they will limit the aerosolization uh, from uh, the exposure for your uh, healthcare providers. Um, they also suggest before the intubation to use bag mask device with a HIPAA filter. And as you can see here, there's uh, the HIPAA filter needs to be applied also with the, with the AMBO bag uh, uh, assembly. And for the adults, you may consider passive oxygenation with a non-rebreathing face mask that is covered with a surgical mask on top. And this is one alternative for a short duration. Uh, if the intubation is delayed, then to consider the supraglottic airway. And another emphasis is to minimize the circuit disconnections. And even after uh, the intubation is successful, if you want to connect the patient to the a ventilator, they emphasize to clamp the ET tube so it 
it, uh, uh, it reduces the time of uh, open circuit to minimal until the AT tube is again connected to the ventilator circuit. One, one of the issues to consider is about the appropriateness of starting and continuing the CPR. Again, this is a, just an added increased risk for our uh, healthcare providers, especially we are talking about uh, possibility of limited resources during a pandemic surge. Uh, some regions, of course, may uh, experience, experience a higher burden of disease compared to others. So always there's a balance, a need to balance with a higher mortality for the critically ill, uh, all the older COVID uh, patients, as uh, some literature demonstrated in, uh, more mortality with increasing age, comorbidities, uh, especially with the cardiovascular disease. However, uh, clinical judgment of the likelihood of success against the risk of to the rescuers and the patients from whom the resources are being diverted. So all of these uh, issues has to be balanced whenever we are talking about how to uh, about the, uh, whether uh, we are doing a futile, a futile uh, CPR or no. We have a fruitful outcome. We need, really need to uh, carry on with this CPR. Addressing the goals of care with the COVID patients or their parents in anticipation of any potential need for increased level of care is always a good idea. So. Upon arrival of the patients to the hospital, you may consider uh, discussing uh, similar issues with the family. If you are uh, thinking about these patients may deteriorate and they may benefit from uh, uh, limiting the uh, life support for them uh, if they have a very poor mortality and outcome, just in case. Uh, adopting policies to guide the determination and uh, about this process and taking into account the patient risk factors for survival. And uh, there is uh, the guideline also emphasized that there is insufficient data to support the uh, ECMO use uh, during uh, CPR uh, for COVID uh, patients. Uh, shifting gears to some situations and setting specific considerations that were mentioned in the AHA guidelines about the out of hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, they put also, they added some comments for the lay rescuers. Uh, so the bystander CPR has consistently been shown to improve the uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest survival. And uh, the only, the main disadvantages with the COVID is that there will be no proper uh, PPE available. And this will predispose uh, to a high risk of uh, COVID infection uh, among the lay uh, rescuers. And this may be more dangerous if the rescuer is uh, in the elder population or having a chronic disease such as cardiac, hypertension, chronic lung disease, or diabetes. So the AHA issued, uh, if you can scan also the code, you can go to their uh, newsroom and uh, see their uh, uh, CPR guide for the lay rescuers about uh, for children and infants. And they, they advise for them uh, to perform chest compressions and consider mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation if willing and able to do that. Uh, keep in mind that the higher incidence of respiratory arrest in children, so the early institution of mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation for children uh, at home may help prevent uh, going to a cardiac arrest. And keeping in mind also that most likely the household members who have been exposed to the victim as home, they already have been exposed to the virus. If, if the cause is a COVID uh, virus, uh, virus, then they have been already exposed to that. So no additional risk for them. And that is the rationale for uh, early mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth station. Okay. Uh, they also advise that uh, a face mask or cloth covering the mouth and nose of the rescuer and the victim may reduce the risk of transmission to a non-household bystander if unable or unwilling to perform the mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation. The defibrillation, as uh, you, all, you know, since it's not expected to be an aerosolization procedure, so if the lay rescuer have access to an AED, then they advise that it should be incorporated in managing such victims. 
a couple of slides about the uh, emergency medical system and the ambulance so for the dispatch and the telecommunication they mentioned that the local protocols should screen all calls for COVID-19 symptoms or known COVID-19 infections in victims or recent contacts including uh, household uh, members and for, for the lay rescuers the dispatcher should uh, provide guidance on risk of uh, COVID-19 for rescuers and the instructions for compression only CPR which is, could be an option. For the AMS the telecommunicators should alert the dispatch team to don the PPE if there is any suspicion for COVID-19 before arrival at the scene. For the transport, the family members and other contacts of the patients with the suspected or confirmed COVID should not ride within the transport vehicle. And if there is a, re a return of uh, spontaneous circulation or ROSC, if this was not being able to achieve at the scene, so the resuscitative efforts at the field were unsuccessful, then uh, the transport team should check with their local policy whether transferring these patients to the hospital will be uh, applied or not, because we have to keep in mind that there will be a lower uh, likelihood of survival. And there is also the added risk of additional exposure to the pre-hospital and the hospital healthcare workers. Moving to our main topic about the in-hospital cardiac arrest. Again, uh, the guidelines, uh, they advise to be proactive and uh, the ad to address the advanced care directives and the goals of care with patients uh, and their uh, parents to closely monitor for early signs and symptoms of clinical deteriorations. If there is a risk of uh, impending cardiac arrest, then to rapidly move the patient to a negative pressure room, if possible, or maybe to provide at least a portable HIPAA filter on the site. Uh, this hopefully will uh, minimize the risk of exposure to rescuers during the resuscitation. And always to keep uh, in mind to close the doors of any negative pressure room or even the regular room to close the risk whenever possible to prevent the airborne contamination of the adjacent indoor space. Uh, about the communication of the COVID-19 status to any new uh, healthcare worker who arrives on the scene, this is really a must, it's a really a priority. So anyone who joins the uh, CPR team, he needs to be alerted from the beginning that this is a COVID suspected patient, so he needs to properly done his uh, PPE. Uh, we, I'm going to just highlight a couple of uh, additions to the algorithm that were provided by the AHA in their uh, updated report uh, about uh, uh, for the COVID. Uh, this is the code again if you want to take a screenshot of this uh, slide uh, where you can scan it later to go for the uh, full uh, algorithm that was published with their interim uh, analysis with their interim uh, uh, recommendations so just go. so here uh, as you can see this is uh, uh, they advise about, they, they incorporated about the donning of the PPE and about the limiting the personnel. And uh, the beauty of these uh, guidelines that they have ha underlined uh, the additions for the COVID algorithms. So it will be easily uh, adopted for anyone who already, who is already familiar with the BLS and the uh, PALS guidelines. He can just immediately uh, pinpoint them very rapidly. Uh, as you can see here also, they added about the use of bag mask device with the, the viral filter and a tight seal. Again, they always emph uh, emphasize about the tight seal between the, uh, the bag mask device and the patient's uh, face just to reduce the aerosolization of the virus. So this is uh, in regards to the uh, ELS. Moving to the... Uh, PALS guidelines. Again, for the PALS, it was it's so much similar to the uh, to the uh, 
conventional or the pre-COVID uh, PALS guidelines with the additions of uh, about donning uh, the PPE, limiting the personnel, uh, starting the, to ventilate with oxygen using the bag mask device with a filter and tight seal, if none available to use the non-rebreather face mask, preparing to intubate early. So maybe this is something uh, new that was added again for early intubation. Uh, prioritization for the intubation, again, uh, to, to pause the chest compressions for intubation. Uh, if intubation is delayed, consider the supraglutic airway or bag mask device with a filter. So uh, previously, in the previous guideline, we used to prioritize our issue for the uh, bag mask ventilation with the high quality CPR. Now with the COVID, they are suggesting no, if you can go for intubation, they ad advise to go for early intubation during the CPR to decrease the aerosolization of the virus and to connect to the ventilator with a filter whenever, as soon as possible. Again, once connected, to minimize the circuit uh, disconnection and to use uh, the intubator with the highest likelihood of first pass success in intubation. Consider video laryngoscopy, as we suggested, and also to, uh, the preference towards cuffed endotracheal tubes, so that will be preferable. Let's go back to our slides. Yes. So just to highlight from those uh, algorithms that, as you have seen, that there is a uh, emphasis about donning the PPE and limiting the personnel for the BLS, and again using the bag mask. Uh, a device with a filter and a tight seal. Uh, and for the uh, pediatric advanced uh, life support, again, they, as you have seen, they also emphasize to don the PPE with a limited personnel, to ventilate with the oxygen using the uh, bag mask with a filter and a tight seal, uh, prioritizing the intubation with the holding of the CPR during the intubation process. All of these together with the minimizing the closed circuit uh, disconnection, using the intubator with the highest uh, uh, ability to intubate from the beginning. Uh, for the intubated uh, patients at the time of the cardiac arrest, so if the patient is already intubated, he's uh, just uh, went into cardiac arrest, so they advise to keep on the mechanical ventilator with a HEPA filter to maintain this closed circuit, to adjust the ventilator setting to allow for the asynchronous ventilation, and uh, to time the chest compressions with the ventilation in uh, neonates, Increasing, of course, the FiO2 to 100% and change the mode to a pressure control, ventilation assist control, limiting the pressure as needed to generate the adequate chest rise, uh, hopefully trying to achieve about 6 ml per kilogram of uh, tidal volume or 4 to 6 ml per kilogram uh, for neonates. Uh, in the ventilator, we have to adjust the trigger to off to prevent the ventilator from auto cycling in case you have chest compressions ongoing and also to possibly prevent the hyperventilation and air trapping with adjustment of the respiratory rate to 10 per minute for adults and children and to 30 per minute for neonates. Uh, of course, we have to assess the need for uh, to adjust the positive, uh, the beep, uh, to balance the lung volume and the venous return adjusting the alarms uh, to silent to prevent the alarm fatigue for your healthcare providers who are present at the CPR scene, ensuring that the endotracheal tube and or tracheostomy and ventilator circuit are uh, secure to prevent any unplanned extubation during the CPR. And if there is a return of spontaneous circulation, then to set the ventilator settings to uh, what's appropriate to patient's uh, new clinical condition. For patients who are prone at the time of the arrest, uh, the prone position without an advanced airway, then uh, to attempt to place the patient in the supine position for continued resuscitation. Uh, they also advise that while the effectiveness of CPR in the prone position is not completely known, 
for those patients who are in the prone position and there is they already have advanced airway like an ET tube, uh, they advise to avoid turning the patient to the supine position unless able to do so without the risk of equipment disconnections and aerosolization because that will be an added risk for all the team. And uh, if you scan this code, you can see one of the demonstration of how to do CPR, uh, chest compressions in the prone position. And the AHA uh, recommends to consider placing the defibrillator pads in the anterior posterior position and to provide CPR with the patient remaining prone with the hands in the standard position over the T7 to T10 vertebral bodies. Of course, post arrest, you will have to consult your hospital's infection control practices and regarding the transport after uh, resuscitation and ROS. So that has to be addressed from your side. Uh, moving briefly to the neonatal resuscitation, although it remains unclear if the uh, neonates uh, are infected or likely to be infectious when the mothers have suspected or confirmed the uh, COVID-19 providers, should don appropriate PPE, and the mother is a potential source of aerosolization for the neonatal team, so this has to be kept in mind. The initial steps, as uh, recommended by the AHA uh, in their PALS guidelines, is to root, uh, that the routine neonatal care and the initial steps of neonatal station are unlikely to be uh, aerosol generating, uh, such as drying the babies or tactile stimulation. However, the suctioning of the airway after delivery should not be performed routinely for uh, clear or meconium stained amniotic fluids. And the suctioning, uh, since it is an uh, aerosol generating procedure, and it's usually not indicated for uncomplicated deliveries. They advise that if the endotracheal medications are to be uh, considered, the installation of these medications through the ET tube such as the surfactant or epinephrine, these are considered as uh, aerosol generating procedures, especially if it's done through uncuffed ET tubes. Uh, therefore, the intravenous delivery of epinephrine uh, via a, uh, a low-lying umbilical venous catheter is the preferred uh, route of administration. And just to make more interaction now, uh, we will have another poll for, uh, let's see, what do you think about uh, what would you use for a COVID suspected infants? Please choose all what you think it's applicable. You have a, okay, so will you do compressions with the mechanical CPR devices? Will you use the closed incubator for care in the PICU, video laryngoscope for intubation, and intubation box if available? Okay, so we had some people who voted for compression with mechanical CPR devices. However, those are just a reminder that these devices are for uh, adolescents or adults. So these are not for younger children or definitely not for infants. Not until now, there are no such devices, uh, to the best of my knowledge, that are licensed in the market. Uh, closed incubator for care in the PICU. Uh, that will be an added bonus to, to consider. Uh, however, just to keep in mind that putting a baby in a closed incubator doesn't really necessitate, uh, doesn't give you a full protection. So that's an extra precaution to add, but it doesn't replace the PPE. The video laryngoscope, if you have it for an, uh, neonates, that will be wonderful. But again, please make sure that you have the appropriate size uh, blades and that your team practice this video laryngoscope beforehand. And uh, the intubation box, if available, was suggested by almost one third of our colleagues. And we'll see a slide about these intubation boxes and uh, how we can uh, utilize them maybe in the future, maybe. So again, just to remind uh, our colleagues that the closed incubators, uh, although they are 
useful for transfer and care for these babies, especially that they will, uh, with the appropriate distancing measures. However, uh, even if used, they do not protect from aerosolization of the virus. So again, the PPE has to be in place. About the intubation boxes, so maybe it came uh, circulated to you. Again, this is not part of the AHA guidelines, but this has been circulating around the intubation boxes, and there are different models that we have seen probably came to you from colleagues uh, trying to minimize the aerosolization during the intubation process. However, uh, some colleagues reported difficulties when they tried it in the simulation center uh, that they were uh, really difficult to uh, perform, uh, definitely not with the conventional laryngoscope. Uh, so if you have these available, but again, they don't replace the proper PPE and just consider them just as an added barrier. Still, unfortunately, we need more research and more standardization because there are so many models that came to the market. So I leave it for your institute to decide which is the best model to apply together as an added bonus with the, B with the PPE. About the airway management, uh, this is uh, one of the nice articles that if you want to take a screenshot of this uh, slide and access the code, this is one of the uh, articles by uh, Cook et al. about the COVID-19 uh, airway management principles, where they emphasize uh, a SAS approach. So uh, they emphasize about the being safe for the staff and the patient accurate, avoiding unreliable, unfamiliar, or repeated techniques, and swift, which is done timely without rush or delay. So I like these two words, no rush and no delay. So just optimization of the system you have. And this is one of the models that uh, we are adopting at our uh, hospital about uh, when you have a patient and you are going for airway procedure. Uh, so uh, you have limiting the staff to the intubator, the one with the best uh, at intubation technique. Uh, we have one, uh, uh, one uh, preferably the RT or one uh, expert healthcare worker in the, uh, for the cricoid pressure or the uh, ventil ventilatory setup equipments and the airway equipments. And one, uh, probably the, uh, the nurse of the patient who can deliver the medications and the monitor. And outside the patient, there is in the, in the ante room, there is a runner who can just uh, move back and forth to bring any extra equipment if needed, or maybe he can also done on quickly and come inside to help his colleagues in case the patient requires. Okay. We'll go to our uh, last poll for our uh, webinar today. What do you think about simulation for COVID or have you done simulation at your center? So uh, did you use uh, simulation at your hospital for COVID-19 uh, patients? I'm just waiting for, okay. So kindly just uh, share with us your experience. Okay, so again, just to, uh, just to, uh, so we have uh, one third of our colleagues who had uh, mainly for uh, donning and doffing uh, as a simulation. We had about uh, one quarter uh, who had at our hospital, uh, their hospital, uh, but uh, almost we have half of them did not have uh, this uh, simulation. So I do advise to go and practice these. And uh, due, uh, this is what they recommend in the guidelines that due to the uncert uncertainties uh, which are inherent in the new processes to be adopted, it is recommended to do regular and full insight to simulation of a planned process 
to familiarize uh, the team and identify any uh, possibilities of problems which may not be uh, thought about previously. One uh, issue I will just uh, advise for all of our colleagues, if you do simulation, please to remember to conserve the PPE usage as much as possible. So minimize it or replace it with other than PPE just to uh, preserve the PPE during the uh, pandemic. A couple of issues just to pay attention to. Uh, please make sure that you are having accurate source, a reliable source of information. Uh, even if it comes to you as a, with a logo of one of the reliable uh, societies, just make sure it's not a preprint and this is the final approved version. So I always advise my colleagues to go to the uh, website of that organization to make sure this is the uh, this is their actual uh, publication or uh, uh, guidelines versus those of social media just rumors or medical opinions which reflect only the medical opinion of their uh, of their uh, colleagues uh, make sure you are uh, checking the most recent uh, guidelines since we have a rapidly evolving uh, guidelines with the covid outbreak uh, make sure to uh, check and comply with the local laws and bylaws and adopted guidelines of your hospital. And uh, please be aware of any uh, of uh, several unofficial training materials that may be circulating in the, especially with the social media, that are not officially related to the international life support organizations. And even some of them, they have similar logos to those societies. However, they are not at all uh, related to them. So please make sure that uh, you, we follow only the reliable sources. In summaries, and this is a barcode here I left if you want to see the summaries of the European uh, resuscitation guidelines because it's similar to our summary. So in summary, all providers must protect themselves and their colleagues and patients from any unnecessary COVID exposures always done before intervening in any emergency situation. A rapid hospitals adaptation of COVID-oriented CPR guidelines for pediatric patients is warranted. And uh, I really suggest to practice any newly implemented guidelines in the simulation drills to make sure that your team is familiar and up to date in that one. And uh, thank you for your time. I try to make it as fast as limited to the time frame. And uh, we can just check some of your questions uh, that were shared by our. Okay. So we have a question from a colleague uh, that uh, it's better to do any CPR maneuver by one rescuer to minimize the risk of getting infected. Uh, in suspected uh, neonates or children. So again, minimizing the number of uh, rescuers uh, on the scene, that uh, would be re reasonable. However, as, uh, as you recall, so once I have maybe the first rescuer who has full PPE go inside, he can start with the CPR. But usually once rescuer doing a CPR by himself, it's fatiguing and it will be less uh, efficient, high quality CPR. So probably you will go with the least number. So you need one, at least one for the airway and the breathing and one for the compressions and one for the medications. But again, just uh, I will suggest to try to test it. And we have another question. Uh, there are some questions about uh, medications like uh, uh, some antiviral, but I'm not. I'm today. Our focus is about the CPR uh, in children. The updates. So I will leave that to more expert colleagues from the ID team. How many pediatric patients with confirmed uh, COVID in the kingdom? That's probably will be from the Ministry of Health uh, uh, websites. How many CPR was done? Again, this is. Um, I. To the best of my knowledge, they, we don't have any critically ill uh, child so far, in, at least in the hospitals that I come across here in the kingdom. But again, we have to be always ready to anticipate any patients who may uh, require uh, CPR. Uh, is it true that suspected and positive uh, COVID patients uh, should make DNR formula for them? Um, 
not sure what that question is. So if we are talking about the DNR uh, or the Do Not Resuscitate the Initiative for COVID patient, again, it has to be treated on a case by case. Uh, so each case has to be addressed and benef uh, just weighing the risk benefit ratio to the patient, him or herself, whether they are uh, having an underlying disease which uh, which deserves to have no uh, no code status. Um, okay, let me see if I can see other questions uh, in case of CPR patients suspected. Let's look at it. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Just trying to see. I have one more question. Just came now. Uh, the most common cause of cardiac arrest in neonates and children uh, with COVID-19. Again, it will be probably the most common cause is the respiratory. So in pediatric, most common cause is respiratory for us. However, since the data is uh, so far limited, uh, probably waiting and seeing for other uh, publications with a higher cohort number of patients, uh, that will be maybe a better approach just to see more uh, what the literature would say to us. And uh, let me see if we can take another question. We have still a few minutes. Um, when I, okay, when I will use prone position and it's uh, for adult, child, or specific persons. Okay, so the prone positioning, again, maybe that's a little bit away from our uh, theme about the CPR. But prone positioning, this is advocated among ARDS uh, in adult COVID patients. For, for our pediatric population, again, it's going to be, uh, for the best of my knowledge, on a case-by-case, case. Uh, just like we uh, do proning for ARDS patients. So until we have further uh, reliable uh, data published in a peer-reviewed publication, that will be uh, maybe my suggestion at that stage. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Do we have any other extra questions or... I will try one more time since we have. Um, okay. So again, uh, thank you all for. I really emph emphasize if you can go for the those publications that I provided the codes for. Uh, you you will find a lot of. Uh, okay, we have a venous access is difficult in children. We need help. So how do we do it? So the new interim AHA guideline did not address any special special issues about the. Uh, venous access. So uh, as you know from the previous past guidelines is to go for the intraosseous early once you think you may need it. The only added here uh, issue is just to put on the proper PPE for any suspected COVID patients. So before going to the patient, probably you need to have proper PPE, whether it is for only for the uh, droplet or airborne and droplet precautions. Any time frame for donning before starting CPR? Uh, the time frame from the literature that I came through uh, from a simulation, it was varied so uh, between three to four minutes. So please remember to put on proper PPE. So if PPE is not put on properly, it wouldn't protect us 100%. And duffing will be even more risky for people when duffing because that's even the more risky procedure. But donning, please put on uh, properly your uh, PPE. If you think that this patient is uh, may go to a cardiac arrest, so as we mentioned, uh, be proactive and put on the PPE early. So that will be my suggestion for you. Uh, however, do not go for uh, for a CPR with, if you have a suspected COVID patient without putting your full PPE, which is appropriate for his uh, or her condition. Okay, uh, I'm just scrolling through any questions. Uh, do CPR in isolation room only? If uh, the patient, if you have time to move the patient to uh, to a negative pressure room, that is that was uh, recommended by the guidelines. However, if you do it in a just in the patient room, you may consider besides putting your full PPE, you may consider uh, bringing in a portable HIPAA filter that may reduce the aerosolization. And please also remember to keep the door closed of the room. Uh, should we do CPR to any arrested COVID patient? It's a case by case definition. 
uh, how we can listen to the lecture again. One colleague is asking, so probably this is from the uh, Saudi Commission for Health Specialities. Hopefully they will list us uh, the link later on. Uh, CPR in prone position, success rate. It's from the adult literature. The CPR in prone position, it's, uh, it didn't, I didn't come across it until now, but probably you will be seeing more literature coming uh, through since we have much more patients who are being in the prone position and COVID. So probably we'll see more publications coming uh, down the, la the line. Uh, okay. So one colleague asking if they do scan for the barcode, a screenshot, how we can, so you can just uh, maybe take a picture of it and then you can, uh, through your iPhone camera, you can just immediately, or through other smartphone, that barcode can immediately take you a hyperlink to the uh, articles that I have uh, incorporated as references to my lecture. Okay, uh, again, uh, thank you all for your time. And uh, I again thank the Saudi Critical Care Society for this uh, opportunity and our colleagues uh, from the Saudi Commission for Health, Health uh, Specialities for their efforts with this webinar hosting. Again, thank you all and be safe. Assalamu alaikum.